Welcome back everybody to our study of the English legal system. We're continuing to talk about the introduction and sources of law that we study when we study the English legal system. This video is going to introduce the concept of the various different sources of law that exist uh, within the English legal system. The aim here is to examine the sources of law uh, in this video as a, just a sort of brief overview understanding of what the sources of law are. And then in the next few lessons, start to talk about, for example, the parliamentary process of lawmaking, um, some of the principles of parliamentary sovereignty, for example, and then also focusing on the development of law through the judicial system, through the common law as well. So, like I said, this is going to serve as a sort of precursor, if you will, to the next few lessons where we discuss at quite great length the various ways in which law is made within the system of the uh, of law in, in, in England and Wales. We're going to look at the sources of law in their abstract, in their generality, examining their nature and exam examining the different sources in which they are derived. So. Ultimately, as a brief overview and as a brief introduction to this particular topic, um, the sources of law in the English legal system um, are derived from three major areas. We have what is known as the sort of non-legal constitutional source of law, which is sometimes described as convention or constitutional convention. We have the common law. And then we also have statute law or, or, or law made by parliament, for example. These are considered to be the three main sources of law within England and within England and Wales within the English legal system. Um, now there are other sources. Okay, um, we do, for example, um, not want to brush over some of the other sources of law which either do exist or have existed in the past. So the law of the European Union, for example, was an incredible influence over the UK's um, legal system. Uh, and so, even though we have left the European Union, we need to talk a little bit about. Um, the law of the EU. And we also just have to talk about international law more broadly, talk about the ways in which, uh, for example, treaty and international custom have influenced and do continue to influence the way in which law operates in the UK as well. And in addition to this as well, we have to think about um, secondary legislation or delegated legislation, which comes out of and is a derived source from statutes. So in looking at these uh, main sources of law, we're going to talk about the first three in this lesson. We're going to talk about convention, we're going to talk about the common law, and we'll talk about legal statutes as well. Beginning first with convention. A constitutional convention, as you will learn when you study public law, or if you are uh, uh, in some particular um, circles of, of universities around the country, they may call it constitutional and administrative law. Uh, but fun fundamentally, a constitutional convention can be described as a sort of general rule of thumb, which is agreed upon by everyone and is sort of followed by all to whom it applies to. So. This is a sort of uh, when we get into uh, when we get into public law, we will look at constitutional conventions in, in, in great detail. But this is a really considered to be a sort of non-legal constitutional source. Now, conventions will develop over many, many years and have developed over many, many years throughout the entire history of law within England and Wales, um, causing Lord Justice Coke to describe uh, constitutional conventions or, co or common custom as being one of the main triangles of the law laws of England. What is quite interesting here is that they are not legally enforceable constitutional conventions because they are non-legal sources of law and because they are considered to be quote-unquote general rules of thumb which are, are followed by everyone to whom it applies to. It means that if you break a constitutional convention, which people tend to do quite often in some circumstances, this means that there is no enforcement mechanism. The sort of way in which we uh, understand conventions and the sort of weight that conventions have comes from this general agreed acceptance by everybody that the convention in question is something that we should be uh, desiring to follow and in a sort of uh, an implicit agreement by everybody that we are going to follow said agreement. On the other hand, the common law is far more enforceable than that of conventions. Arguably the oldest source of law in England and Wales, um, the common law developed out of centuries of court and judge-based decisions. So, um, for example, judge-made law is done through various different principles uh, of judicial precedent. Things like stare decisis, we have, um, we, we have various different ways uh, in which we can understand judicial precedent 
the kind of uh, ratio decedendi of a decision, for example, all of these sort of Latin phraseologies, um, which we're going to get to in future lessons time. But judge made law is done through these various principles by which we have this idea of judicial precedent. And the idea of judicial precedent is the idea that a case decision may inform the creation of principles in the future. So a case may come to often a higher court, so maybe a court of appeal or, uh, or, or the House of Lords or the Supreme Court as it is now today, um, and they may um, make a decision as to the principle of law which is to be applied in that particular case. And that principle of law then becomes precedent. It then becomes the rule that is followed by future courts and is then cited as precedent in future courts decisions sometimes you may think that and you may see the uh, a case for example a, a common law case a judicial case being described as an authority and the reason why it's described as an authority is because it is an as the name suggests an authority on a particular legal issue the idea for example of the case of donahue and stevenson in the case of in the law of tort is an authority on the nature of general negligence and foreseeability, which then is applied through judicial precedent in the future. That is how the common law becomes a legal system, which is important to recognise. A common example of common law rules is this idea of the crime of murder. Murder is what is known as a common law offence. It is a, a, an offence that has no legal statute uh, which outlines the crime of murder. And we can contrast this to, for example, sexual offences, which are established by the Sexual Offences Act of 2003. And the Sexual Offences Act of 2003 represents what is known as statute law. It is law which is created by some kind of institutional legislature. In the case of England and Wales, the most important institutional legislature, the most supreme institutional legislature, is that of Parliament, situated in Westminster, this, uh, this uh, above the screen here, the image that we see with Big Ben and the Palace of Westminster um, as well. Now, essentially, an Act of Parliament is a piece of legislation which has been passed by both Houses of Commons and the House of Lords, and then has gone on to receive royal assent. Now, new laws can be made by an Act of Parliament. In addition to this, old laws can be revoked by an Act of Parliament. And principles of the common law can even be reformed and changed as a result of an Act of Parliament as well. This is because of a principle known as the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Essentially, Parliament is the supreme lawmaking authority in the United Kingdom including England and Wales. And so as a result of this, the common law is subservient to the uh, law of Parliament. And we will get to why that is the case when we look at the history of parliamentary sovereignty in our lessons on the history, uh, on, sorry, on, on public law in future lessons time. 